very much, sir. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, we will come back to uh, many of the points you've raised uh, in, the, in the rest of our panel. But uh, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was something. Um, let me introduce very briefly the, the rest of the panelists. Uh, we have uh, Marku Markulo. He's the first vice president of the European Committee of the Regions. Thank you for coming, Marku. We have Angela Martinez Sarasola. She's uh, uh, head of Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania unit at the Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policy, representing the European Commission. Uh, we have uh, Johan Kraft coming from Stockholm today, am I right? Uh, he is um, General Director and Head of Department of Sustainable Growth at the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation of Sweden. And we have Vester Selminch arriving as well. Um, she, he is an anthropologist uh, and urban planner um, from Latvia here. Right, so what we will do, uh, the rest of you uh, will have an opportunity to uh, give your remarks um, uh, prepared or otherwise, as, as they may be. But I would invite, uh, nevertheless, if possible, to reflect on, on the many things or some of the things that we heard in, in uh, uh, Mr. Barka's presentation uh, here, because, because I think it, it, uh, it just demands certain um, uh, expansion and elaboration uh, in, our, in our discussion today. Let us begin with uh, Mr. Markula. Uh, we'll, yeah. Just grab the mic and, and, and you're done. Ten minutes? Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me and the Committee of the Region to be part of this interesting panel. Um, let me start that for our own five-year priorities, uh, actually defined and approved by our plenary three years ago already. So period that we are ongoing, we started that we need to have growth, but not whatever growth, it needs to be sustainable. And that needs much more attention on the local level, local and regional level, kind of boosting the bottom-up movements. And on that, so we defined uh, three major kind of focus areas, how we need to change Europe. So first, focus much more on the entrepreneurial mindset, uh, focus much more on uh, digitalizing different processes, kind of fully uh, functioning digital single market movement. And then the third was smart specialization. And that is strongly on the local uh, place-based approach to the European development. And when I link that, so let's put that a bit on the uh, European frame in general. So already four years ago, there was kind of a quite strong interest to put uh, what we call the three no's. So no, no, no. What, does, what were those? So no more money to Brussels no more institutions and uh, new uh, complex structures, and no more regulations from Brussels. Instead of this, so Commission and the Council prepared already in 2011, proposed a three yes, yes is rule. More uh, complementary funding, more institutional coordination, and more new projects. What we have taken and discussed uh, with the Committee of the Region, representing all the regions and cities in Europe, so that we would uh, um, go much further and, and faster, reframing these ye three yeses rules. So yes to better synergies with uh, funding instruments, and not only public uh, EU instruments, but private money as well. The second yes to better integration of existing structures, into macro-regional strategies and smart specialization of all the regions so that the regions can collaborate much more on the European level based on their priorities. And then the third, yes, that I would uh, like to uh, phrase it so that uh, uh, yes to using cohesion funds to increase both local collaboration and European partnerships. And what we heard in the morning about the European Investment Bank, so actually one of the high priorities now should be use locally the cohesion funds to prepare good proposals for the sustainable growth using, again, uh, uh, these uh, strategic investments, uh, money of the European Investment Bank and many. So there's much more that we could do by using the cohesion funds. 
and very much using the knowledge, latest knowledge, best practices, and that happens not only locally. Don't use your own brain only, but uh, use the others as well and collaborate. And uh, when we think about that, so that when now looking back to last year's uh, talking about the cohesion, so with the Committee of the Regions, together with the regions around Europe, we launched uh, the Cohesion Alliance to influence on the future cohesion policy, and especially now what is now in the proposals of the commissions on the, for the MFF. So much has been already achieved in this Cohesion Alliance, so we had our focus uh, uh, proposals, uh, signed by altogether uh, more than 100 regions, almost uh, 6,000 signatories, and more than uh, 60 national and European associations of regions and cities. And these are now quite nicely embedded on the proposals of the Commission, although that there are many things that we still don't agree, we try to influence on that, including the level of the money should be higher. But when we think about this now, so what we should not do, not spend that much time in Brussels on talking with the Commission on these proposals, but influencing everywhere to our, the governments of the member states, because it's the Council uh, has a strong uh, say on this, what, but it's, it's Parliament, uh, Council, and the Commission really the trilogue negotiation. So, and this is important now when we look this uh, recent uh, development and when linking what Fabrizio Parker just uh, uh, highlighted very strongly so there were a lot that we need now more awareness building so both local and regional politicians need to see this the whole big picture and on, on that so your approach very very interesting and very very strong and it means more participation and engagement uh, that we need to highlight, and that means the multi-level governance. All levels of the governance need to try to do more hand in hand, and that goes through the participation and, and engagement. And there I have a couple of the statements so that uh, this uh, better European governance not only involves legislation that respect the principle of subsidiary, but we need more uh, means to collaborate, and on that so the approach to place-based uh, ecosystems is, is very crucial. We need to see the local level and use the cohesion funds, but as well integrating then private and public money coming from uh, through the universities, through the companies, so that we develop the, the concepts. And there I want to be being now in Riga, on, uh, just to highlight with an example of what is one of those uh, uh, interact activities on this Baltic Sea, and that is the Baltic Sea uh, region smart up, where we focus much on the uh, smart specialization. What does it mean really to build these local ecosystems through the collaboration and bench learning, not just benchmarking with the other regions around in all the Baltic uh, Sea region states, but all of those, and that's a very interesting project that I participated in, in a, a bit, and then talking especially on the level of my mayors, ministers, and regional politicians, so how to use the results of these concrete measures. This is kind of activity is very much, unfortunately, lacking, so that projects live their own life, especially when they get the funding, so then they keep on for that uh, two, three year period and, and then bring the results. We need to integrate people at all level. Here in Latvia, uh, one of these, so it's, it's uh, in the partnering on this uh, smart specialization initiative, we have the University of Latvia, there is the Ministry of Education and Science, but as well, local uh, municipalities are strongly on that and a couple of the others. And here in August next year will be one of those three-day innovation camps where we integrate people for the participation, bench learning with the other regions as well. So this is a good example where we can move uh, ahead. Uh, let's integrate these experiences to the uh, what is now on the 
Commission proposal, especially the new common provision regulations and the regional development funds. And one thing that I want to stress there heavily is the experiences of ITIs, so integrated territorial investments. We have done in Finland a good approach on this so that government made the decision to use all this urban part uh, uh, of the uh, uh, cohesion financing for the six largest cities, a project called Six ICA, Six Time, so that they need to collaborate, create local initiatives, and then integrate the results for kind of uh, e experimenting, piloting, and then scaling up for the use of the others. And now the good results are, are then broader scale, and now we try to go through with the commission as well, how to have more of that kind for the next uh, program period. And on that, so it's, it means what is an important new element there, the, the new article uh, on this uh, in the proposal, especially the one on uh, community-led local development. So it's the local communities that makes a strong input on this and then based on this uh, place-based ecosystem development. I think these kind of activities are the ones that we need then to integrate the new commission policy pro pro programs like Digital Europe is a good example because that's the future through artificial intelligence, through the digitalized platforms, and that's where we get the companies play an important role because they see that's their future as well. And we have in all of these countries, Baltic countries, a lot of good examples how slowly but anyhow getting faster and faster movements are starting to be. And that is our contribution that we want to increase this kind of development by the Committee of the Region as well. Learn from the all parts of Europe and uh, scale up the best results for the use of the others as well. And on that, happy to be here. So Latvia as well is nicely on this uh, process uh, along with the others. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for that uh, intervention. I'm, I'm very keen to hear uh, what the Commission has to, uh, uh, to contribute to our uh, discussion today about all this. So, uh, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, uh, to the Latvian authorities for inviting me also to participate in, in this panel and maybe have, uh, well, the Commission's views on the future cohesion policy, but also maybe also the operational insight as I, I've been, I have the privilege of uh, being in charge of uh, monitoring the implementation of the cohesion policy in the three Baltic states and, and Finland. And in this respect, I'm also honored to be here uh, and joining the celebration of the 100 years anniversary of the three Baltic states and sharing with you also at this occasion uh, the 30 years anniversary of the cohesion policy, which of course is the topic of today's uh, discussion. I would like to start my intervention first by uh, acknowledging the impressive convergence and impressive effort and economic development done by the, mainly the three Baltic states. And I think I would like to congratulate uh, here publicly uh, these three Baltic states for the norm, enormous, as I said, convergence effort, uh, where uh, we, they have moved from uh, around 50 to 60, I mean, with the difference between, of course, uh, Latvia, Estonia, and, 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 and Lithuania from 50 to 60 GDP per capita on average to 65 and 75 percent in average. I think Lithuania has been the, the fastest uh, can, um, a member state uh, in the whole Europe uh, in, order, in, in, in terms of convergence. So I think here is, I, I think, uh, a merited congratulations to all uh, stakeholders in, the, in, 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 in Latvia. And I think also, I think today we are also witnesses that uh, the cohesion policy has contributed, of course, to this achievement. And I think also this is not only about cohesion policy, but I think it's been also about efficient use an uptake of the cohesion policy implementation in the three Baltic states. And we are very proud where we can show the good examples, the success stories of the cohesion policy. And I think here clearly the three Baltic states are clearly the success stories of the cohesion policy. Um, these are the, the good news, but of course, despite of these good results, I think we all agree that we cannot stop here. Huh? 
and I think uh, we have heard this morning also from, from the different uh, participants, including the Minister of, of, of Finance in Latvia, and that's why the Commission, of course, has uh, proposed to renew uh, the, the cohesion policy, to continue the cohesion policy, and even to try to reinforce the cohesion policy, not necessarily maybe with financial means, but maybe to find ways to reinforce still the efficiency of this cohesion policy. Uh, also because it's not only about continuing uh, the catching up process and the convergence, but it's also about, about addressing new challenges. And I think many of the challenges have been also addressed uh, this morning. Maybe here I would like maybe to recall or to put, or to put them back on the table, uh, which I think was also the, the aim of, of the panel discussion today, uh, the population and the demographical uh, decline. Uh, both from both angles in terms of migration but also aging of, of the population and we have to take into account that two-thirds of the population in the U13 are living in regions with declining population and also the fact that mainly these declining populations are um, experiencing uh, are um, located in rural or coastal areas and I think here the Baltic uh, states are not escaping from that, mainly uh, it's an issue for Latvia and Lithuania, I'll let, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll extend to, uh, for, for, for Estonia. They are also uh, very much social challenges that we have also here and there discussed, but I would like to also to, to highlight, especially on the labor force in terms of uh, shrinking labor force and, and, and having a lack of uh, skilled labor force agenda, and also the implications in terms of education and the healthcare. But um, something which was also touched then by Professor Barca, which was the, one, the main element I wanted to highlight as main challenge, is the inequalities. Uh, where we have seen now in the cohesion report that inequalities, although there has been some catching up and some convergence on national level, and this is the same also true for the three Baltic states, they are still growing inequalities uh, and disparities among the regions. And I think this is clearly the case for Lithuania and Estonia, to a less extent for Latvia in terms that they have not really increased, but I will say that the, the starting point was already very high also in terms of regional divergences. So this, I think, this is an, a challenge that needs to be put on the table, including also the inequalities among people, uh, the societal inequalities, not only among regions, but among people. And we have, especially in the three Baltic states, also uh, the income inequalities and the risk, at risk of poverty um, indicators, which are still ranking very, very high uh, in, in the European average. So I'm not going to launch the debate here if these inequalities are inherent or not inherent of the catching up process, but I think that what is clear is that we believe that time has come now, maybe in the new generation of the cohesion policy, and when looking at the new preparation of the future cohesion policy, is that the Baltic, at least the Baltic state, should become more territorial and socially cohesive. So that is the benefit of this convergence. As we were saying, Minister of Finance were referring um, this morning to be in balance and being equally among the member states. I think also it has come the moment where this convergence and this prosperity is also benefiting uh, all uh, the citizens in, 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 in Latvia or in, in the Baltic states. Um, Globalization also is, is also an, an additional challenge, which is also impacting how business are also operating, not only citizens, but also business. And then the, the regional specialization, the tailor-made approaches uh, are also in, uh, maybe more suitable or more needed now to adapt to new technologies or generate new investment. So having said this, and in front of these challenges, the Commission, and we have this morning extensively heard about it. The Commission has put forward uh, the new proposal for the new cohesion policy, leaving aside uh, the financial envelope and the size of the cohesion fund financing. We believe that um, the new uh, proposal is, is, is really a balanced proposal, uh, proposing a reform and a modern cohesion policy. And I would like maybe here to stress three or four elements which um, I would like maybe to put into to the context here before moving maybe to the territorial dimension. One will be what we have, and, and there we also agree, in the linkage between the cohesion fund 
and, and the, the European semester and the structural reforms, increasing also or modernizing or, ref, or even reforming the EU governance level, where also the cohesion policy will be now much more closely aligned to the, in the European semester. The second one, which uh, I guess you, you are expecting me to also name and shame it, is simplification. I know that is, uh, there, are, there is a lot of skepticism around, but uh, we, at least at the Commission, we believe that this time uh, could be true, and that we think that um, uh, also there is a balance proposed and echo in a bit what the Minister of Finance said this morning between leaving things as they are, if they are working, why we should touch them, and, and now people have, have learned how to do it, so why we should change it. But maybe it's about also keeping the balance between what is working, but also maybe trying to get rid of what is not working. And I will not approach this in a very bureaucratic manner, talking about simplification of measures. I will talk on, on, on more on the level of building trust, and I think this was also mentioned by Professor Barca, is about building trust again, and maybe trusting the, 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 the authorities, the experience of the authorities, and, and maybe then working more on results and ownership and deliverables rather than on procedures. Why I'm saying this is because simplification is not a goal and it's not a, a, an element that we want to sell, it's because we believe that a simple and an easier cohesion policy will also be much more adaptable also to the individual regions, to the individual cities, and to the individual citizens. So it's about this adaptability of the cohesion policy to the place-based approach that we are talking. So it's not an objective per se, but it's about how could we find a policy which is easily operational, but easily adaptable to the different place-based approaches. This will also be very important uh, when um, talking about the cooperation dimension that uh, Marco Marcula referred to, because we believe that this is also a, an important intervention that needs now to be more mainstream, more built in, in the cohesion policy, where um, the countries which are um, facing common challenges could also try to find common common solutions and tackling maybe the, 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 the challenges in a common way. I think here the three Baltics are already cooperating and have a, a, an important cooperation level, but maybe also to extend this cooperation level, for example, to the Baltic Sea region through the macro, the macro regional strategies. The, second, the third element after the structural reforms, the simplification I wanted to refer is flexibility. We believe that in the new package, we are bringing also a much more flexible cohesion policy. First, by concentrating uh, the interventions and the thematic objectives on, uh, by five, concentrating them, of course, on a smart. As we were saying this morning from Loretta, we have to concentrate on, uh, on the increasing competitiveness of the European as a whole. But we don't have to forget, of course, uh, the green uh, Europe and uh, the connected. We need to be to continue connected, but also the, increase, the inclusive society role. But the way these uh, policy objectives have been defined, they have been defined in a much more flexible manner than in the current programming period. So again. Uh, the, the national authorities, the regional authorities, and the local authorities can pick and choose and be able to, to work a bit out with the different priorities in a much more flexible manner. And the last element I wanted to bring, and then I come to maybe to the real territorial dimension here, is that in the proposal of the Commission, uh, the fifth thematic objective is what we call the place-based policy objective, which is been for the first time uh, proposed, where it's an attempt to bring still Europe even more closer to citizens. Huh? We think that, well, we know that cohesion policy it has in his, its genes, I would say, to be close to citizens, to move from the European Union level to the local level needs, but maybe sometimes it has maybe stopped so often at national or regional level. And the idea here by this new policy objective is to still go a step further and bring in the cohesion policy still even a step further close to the citizens. Here, I would like to maybe highlight, and I think we will have maybe the occasion in the panel discussion to go through, but I would like still to highlight four features. 
One is, again, that the new policy objective uh, five, place-based policy objective, and the streamline also territorial instruments that uh, Mr. Markula was also referring to, will provide greater thematic flexibility. So again, and uh, Professor Barca was referring to the integration, to the integrated projects and the integrated strategies. So we believe that with this flexibility, uh, the local authorities and the regions will be able to get more integrated, uh, or at least easily integrated projects. And the idea is to work uh, across multi-sectoral approaches and also breaking silos up, uh, among the different policy levels. The second element is also what uh, Professor Barca also referred to is the urban-rural divide. So by also in this policy objective, uh, we are also encouraging um, and the different regions, member states and local authorities to go beyond the administrative boundaries because we very often are bound in the cohesion policy to the administrative boundaries, uh, who is doing what, who has the competence, who is in charge of. And what we would like to promote here is also to work on the basis of the functional area approaches and where the territory should be underpinned not by administrative boundaries but by common challenges, development needs and growth potentials. The third one is the stronger partnership. Partnership is also being in the genes of the cohesion policy, but maybe pushing partnership a bit further, a bit further to the role of the cities and the local authorities. And uh, I think this policy objective is especially about this governance method of working together at odd levels. But I will also like to strengthen here that we are maybe sometimes when we talk about this, we tend to, to, to focus on implementation. So we work together in the implementation process. And I think here, and my message today here is that we should work on, together at the programming level as well, and the, def and the definition of the programming, at the design of the policies, at the design of the, of the, of the, of, of the programs. I very often have the impression that sometimes it's about financial envelopes which are sort of negotiated ex ante and then leave to the different actors to develop and implement. And I think we need to break these uh, dynamics. And it's about jointly programming together in order to first design the integrated strategies and then discuss the implementation. And hand to hand with this uh, multi-level governance and the role of the local authorities and, and cities is the capacity issue. Uh, and I heard here also that sometimes local authorities don't, they cannot do it. They don't know how to do it. They have other things in mind. So uh, for, for the Commission, what will be also very important in these new uh, po policy objectives will be to also be able to bring the necessary capacity to the local level so they can become real actors, uh, real engineers of this integrated development strategy. Um, I think I will maybe stop here uh, and I think maybe uh, my, own, my only remark will be that we think that now is, is, is now we are opening the new programming period the reflections for the future not only on the design of the policy but also on the design of the programs for 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 Latvia and for the three Baltic states and I think that mainly this is maybe the right time where we start thinking at all levels including the local levels to already start uh, developing and programming these the integrated development strategies and addressing also these capacity challenges so all the actors can also play, uh, play the game. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, covering uh, such a large um, field of uh, um, different aspects within that policy. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, Mr. Croft there, uh, I would like to encourage uh, some of you. Uh, we have difficulties actually uh, figuring out whether there's anyone left uh, in the in the audience, but I, I suppose there are some uh, some of you. Uh, you are all persons somehow connected to the cohesion policy, so please, um, I, I, you will have an opportunity to get involved in the conversation. I have some uh, questions from from some of you that you have asked to you know write down and address to the audience. But nevertheless, if anyone wants to get involved, uh, please, you'll have an opportunity and. Um, uh, Swedish perspective on all this. Your 10 minutes, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this extremely interesting debate uh, and discussions. Um, 
I would like to share with you uh, uh, no less than six Swedish experiences when it comes to uh, design and implementation of the cohesion policy, how we have done it. And there uh, might be few possible answers to some of the problems pointed out earlier in this panel. Now, uh, let me start uh, with the bottom-up approach. Um, this has been mentioned several times already now in the last hour. Uh, what we do here uh, at home in Stockholm and in Sweden is, of course, to see the role of the government as to provide the regions with tools needed and then let them decide on the actions necessary in order to create sustainable regional growth. So basically, it's a bottom-up approach. Now, this can't go on just like that. It needs certain frames, let's say. But we have, um, over the years, developed uh, a special strategy within, uh, it's a five-year strategy, and the strategy guides the development and implementation of the regional development strategies. So it's a national strategy, pointing out the overall, uh, let's say, uh, guidelines for the regional uh, strategies. So that was the second experience that we have, that we think is, well, pr promoting an efficient uh, design and implementation of the regional policies. Now, the third experience is of, well, it is an obvious one, actually, but we, the EU cohesion policy is an integrated part of regional growth policy in Sweden. And of course, an important part of the national as well as the regional development strategies. So it's integrated. Probably not a revolutionary idea, but still it's important to point that out. Um, my fourth point would be what I would like to call the horizontal uh, approach, meaning that we are putting a lot of effort into trying to um, engage uh, all different policy areas, all ministries, all agencies uh, that has something to contribute to when it comes to regional policy and regional growth. I mean, talking about labor market, environmental policy, uh, and so on. And one example is, of course, the industry policy, where uh, we, we have a closely intertwined uh, uh, the industry policy and, and enterprise policy with regional growth policy. For example, the territorial dimension is clearly recognized in the government strategy for smart industry. And the stra this strategy was followed by an action plan in order to enable the regions to apply for financing for industry development just to give you an example of how this can be designed. Now, my fifth point here, and my fifth experience, is uh, well, the multi-level approach. Uh, you need to engage the local, regional, national, and EU level. And you have to do it uh, extensively, and you have to do it um, systematically. Um, if you do, that definitely contributes to, 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 uh, to the success of the, of the cohesion policy, but also the region, regional growth policy in every member state, hopefully. My sixth and final experience that I want just to mention for you is, of course, the importance of clo close cooperation uh, a dialogue with all stakeholders on the different levels. And over the years, this, uh, as well as the, uh, the other instruments mentioned by me, is of course, has developed over the years. Now, over the last four or five years, we have had se uh, a special forum set up on the political level, as well as on the civil servant level, meeting several times every year in order to have this dialogue, this close cooperation, discussing everything, I would say. It could be provisions of skills in the regions, could be integration issues, could be spatial planning and, and, and housing, just to mention some example. And these dialogues are also important from an horizontal point of view, because then you can invite colleagues from other ministries to, you know, 
try to explain what they have done or what they might have not done when it comes to labor market, for example. Now, finally, just a few brief words about uh, what we are trying to, where we are trying to, in which areas where we are trying to, to um, direct the regional fund programs. 80% uh, of these funds uh, are targeted at strengthening innovation capacity, the transition to a low carbon economy and improving the competitiveness of small and medium sized enterprises. For example, through improved supply of capital, internationalization and business development. Um, we can see that rural Sweden is doing relatively well uh, in terms of economic development. Uh, and uh, I should, when I say that, I re one should not be mistaken. There is still a very strong urbanization in Sweden, one of the strongest in Europe, actually. Uh, and uh, there are still huge uh, challenges for rural areas and regions, just to say that it's not hopeless. Uh, and uh, there are also, uh, as we see it, a great potentials uh, out in regions, not the least out from place-based assets like tourism, natural resources, and renewable energy. Uh, and this applies not the least to the northern and most sparsely populated parts of Sweden. Sweden is a huge country with not that many inhabitants. Um, but to further strengthen the growth and development in rural areas, the government recently uh, impl started to implement a policy um, promoting the uh, rural development. And this new rural policy encompasses various aspects of entrepreneurship, employment, housing, culture, commercial services, digital communications, transport infrastructure and welfare. So this gives you a little bit of a picture of this horizontal approach that I was trying to, to, to explain to you earlier. So, just to conclude, uh, our experience so far is that bottom-up approach to have an overall strategy, horizontal approach, multi-level discussions, close cooperation, and of course, a result-oriented uh, approach, we think are key factors in order to get somewhere. It, uh, it's not easy. It has developed over the years, and I have been following this from different positions over the years, and it's very clear that it has developed very positively. It takes time, but I think uh, we can see it at the national level from the minister's point of view, but we can also hear it from our partners on the regional level that they see how things are improving and they are for example very keen on having a continued clear link between uh, EU 2020 or whatever comes after and, and the cohesion policy. That's I think is a good example how they have uh, uh, kind of showed support for some of the improvements made. So let me just say it's a continuous process I see it improvement, I mean. We have done, we have come, we have come somewhere, I would say, uh, in Sweden at least, uh, but it's still a lot to do and it's always a challenge, of course, to implement a new program for many reasons. So this continuous struggle to improve the design and, and, and implementation, I think, is something that has to go on forever, probably, until we reach total convergence, but that's still uh, some way to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this. Um, let us conclude uh, our first uh, round uh, in, in this panel by, well, we began with an academic look at it, and, and we'll uh, finish as well that first round with an academic look at it. Mr. Stomich, um, from your point of view, what works and what doesn't, what needs to be changed? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the organizers for having me on a panel. Obviously, I don't really fit in the panel, first from my age, and second of all, I'm not uh, part of any institution that deals with cohesion. I am an anthropologist, so I work with communities, number one. I'm an urban planner that works with cities. So what I'm going to say is going to fit in, in, in those two areas or two hats that I'm wearing on, on a daily basis. So community building and cities, and, and I think some of those issues deal with uh, what cohesion has in mind, and obviously uh, the cohesion policy is in good hands here, so I'll contribute for my... Um, uh, optics here. 
Uh, I'll, I'll touch on four issues. Number one, uh, what is happening with work? Uh, what is happening with place or geographies? Or as Professor Barker said, the renaissance of place-based uh, strategies and placemaking. In That's number two. Uh, number three, is social challenges or what communities are dealing with in, in, in this day and age. And number three is the vitamin C, the cooperation, uh, which I think is absolutely fundamental and crucial. And, and Mr. Kraft finished in, I think, on that note uh, very poignantly. But before I get into that, let me give you a story that I think brings in together the, the, some of the issues that I've brought up. A year ago, I was in Helsinki, and uh, there, was a, there was a large uh, a conference, and part of the conference was a, 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 a presentation on how the local public library was about to be developed in, in, in Helsinki. Now let me ask you a question, those of you who are in the audience. When was the last time you set your foot in the library? In, a, in last month, in last month. Oh, quite a few, great. Um, what they did in Helsinki, and many wonderful things coming up for him in Helsinki, the process of building is about to start in 2018 and 19, but what they did before that uh, they said, how about we change things around and ask the people? Library itself is obviously a cohesive instrument for community and has been so for, for ages. And so what they did, they said, well, how about we go wild and ask people what would they like to have from a library? What services would they like to have? So what they did, they said, number, the, the th of the th three floors the library is going to have, the one floor is going to be open to the public. And they said, we will decide in the plan what's happening in number floor number two and number three. Uh, and funnily enough, the number three and the shape and the size of the, of the, of the library uh, is in, in the form of a cloud. Why cloud? Because obviously books and, and, and generally information is moving to the cloud. So they're putting the idea of, of what happens with information these days into the building itself. So building becomes a, a means of communication. And for a lot of, lot of part, uh, libraries all around the world are struggling with how do you get the younger generation and build the habits early on how to get the young people into, into, um, uh, into libraries. So obviously using the shape and form of library as a means of communication is a great way of thinking and, and, and kudos to, to Helsinki for thinking about that. But number, and more importantly, they said that the, the first floor of the library will be the public one. Why? Because we understand that the libraries are no longer just uh, uh, repositories of knowledge and books. There are working spaces, and some people say that uh, sometimes the libraries are the biggest co-working spaces, uh, you know, kind of a, a camouflage as co-working spaces in a city, rather than sitting in a cafe, you, you sit in a library. So with that in mind, they say, how about we open up the whole uh, gene and DNA of library to the public? And, and they did so, and, and the outcome was wonderful. You know, people came in uh, and, and shared their ideas of what they like to have from their local library. And obviously, one thing is that the architects and designers have input from the users as to how the library should look like. Number two, the uh, library is sending out a message of what kind of partner is it in the city, right? And obviously that was a, a, a kind of more demanding part of the city. And uh, reaching out to the people uh, who wouldn't, wouldn't think of library as their point of, of, of uh, destination ever was a big challenge. In other words, they are putting the, uh, the, the money where the, uh, the mouth is. They're, they're literally reaching out to communities which would never think of library as their destination. So in some ways, I think this is a, a, a good uh, rule of how a cohesion policy should look like. You should definitely speak out and connect with people who is your audience. You should use the interface to service their needs and possibly integrate those communities which are less served, right? Isn't that supposed to what cohesion is supposed to do? And I think you know, and obviously I'm, I'm saying this as an urban planner, I don't work in, 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 in a state level, I work in a community level, and I think cohesion is really, you know, where the, where the rubber hits the road is this, the library level, is, is I think is one instance, and when, and when, in case of Helsinki, that performed very well, and I hope that once library is open, the first floor really will address the needs of the people, such as digitization and digital gap, literacy, literacy and, and other issues that we're dealing with in these high, high lofty goals of the European Commission. So th I think that's the kind of level I, I love our municipalities and our institutions, the public institutions to work at. Really facing the client, being open, being transparent, uh, failing fast. So just imagine the typical scenario uh, a library uh, would function. You know, they would hire an architect, he would make a design, four people would consult the design and builders would build it, probably making, you know, four or five mistakes and lagging behind on 12 months. So that's a typical process. 
by opening the process up, perhaps making it a little longer, they have reached out to five or 600 people in that. So that just really changes the way the, the library works. Uh, um, and, and I think that's a, if anything, that's, that's a, a guidebook of how public institutions should work in general, if they want to be agile, fail fast, and operate as a startup more. So we, we hear a lot that the cities are now operating as a startups and, and, and learning from startups, from agility, from speed, from design perspective, and I think the cohesion policy is, has a lot to learn from that if it wants to build on, on the lofty goal there. So with that, with, with that kind of a imaginative story, let me go through the four, four points. Number one is work. What we're seeing from small to medium-sized cities and big cities is work. Uh, that uh, co big companies are following people, rather than the other way around. That people follow work, and and this does sound ch challenging and paradoxical, but we we see it even more so that uh, for ICT and and digital areas, companies are are willing to go very far to 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 get people and and take mo them, uh, most of the critical mass. Uh, number two. Work has changed itself. You can work remotely, which uh, is, 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 I think, uh, undercurrent to what Professor Barker was saying, that people have uh, different ideas of how they can operate. And there's a famous Rem Kolkhaz's picture where you see a typical uh, Dutch landscape with uh, two windmills in the picture. And he's, he's asking a provocative question, what do you think happens in that landscape? You know, and there's a, there's a typical green moan and, 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 uh, and a cow. But in fact, most of the, most of the buildings in, 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 uh, in the picture are not occupied by rural uh, or agricultural businesses. Where there's a yoga studio, there's a distant uh, tax, uh, tax revenue audit uh, lawyer working there, uh, there's a rock studio uh, for bands to come and contemplate, and there's, a, and there's an innovation center where the big corporations come and think outside of the box. So that's a typical landscape from the first point of view, but actually when you look in, in, inside of the in buildings, they're no longer working in agriculture. So what we, what we just find is what is rural is really changing, and that's, that's the reality across of Europe, not just Latvia or, or the Dutch. Number three, mobility is changing f f fast. People are not, no longer use, using just public transport, or different means of transport. Share mobility is on the rise, so I think that's a, that, that, is the, that is the fuel that, that really uh, um, moves along the, the views that, that were professed by Professor Barca, that you can have these little pockets of innovative action inside of rural areas, which would otherwise would be lost even from the, uh, God's point of view. No, they are changing because people navigate differently. Perhaps there's the age coming in. Those might be a decile between 20 years and 30 years. The people of different age would move to these areas, but that's still happening. Number two, the renaissance of space. Is, is, is coming back not just from cohesion policy, but from um, general uh, approach to quality of life. So there's, there's, no, there's not a, a secret to you. The cities these days compete uh, on, 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 on how attractive they are to, the, to, the, to those of talented class, right? So, um, you know, Zurich and, and Vienna and, and, and Melbourne and cities around the world, they're, look, they're looking, trying to look as good and as livable as possible. So I think that's a fantastic uh, opportunity for those small and medium-sized cities, which offer great quality of life, in, in other words, the, the ratio of the green and the blue infrastructure, and hopefully access, access and uh, novel forms of mobility. So Hyperloop, welcome. Um, and, and those have to be... Uh, held closely with these small uh, initiatives that come from artisan, uh, artisan um, workshops and artisan um, industry, which are then interlinked to the tourism strategies uh, and um, uh, seasonal strategies of tourism in, in, in winter and, and in summer, uh, and uh, corporate work uh, as an in, as in innovation and, and uh, uh, seminars. So those three things, I think, is, is, is something that can be done in the small and uh, medium cities. So that's uh, work, that's place. Number three, uh, social challenges. Not only we are uh, uh, a um, society that is shrinking, in, in the Baltics especially, but also are aging. So th those people who are left behind, not only uh, they are left without a social services, but they also are left without skills. So digital illiteracy is an is a enormous uh, challenge here. Uh, about 15% of population of work, uh, working age is not using internet on a regular basis. You can just imagine the, the enormity of, of challenge that puts on social resources to integrate those people in, in the workforce. So uh, people living longer, 
uh, they require larger pensions and the amount of people that are in, in, in the workforce is, is decreasing, uh, which puts huge strain on local authority to, uh, to adapt to short-termism, to make sure that they are elected just in, in, on a second service. Um, and lastly, uh, the vitamin C, the cooperation, which I think is in some ways the last point, but the most important point, especially in the Baltics, I think the cooperation and being agile and open to, to, uh, to, um, to partnerships uh, is, is, is fundamental. So when, when, we, when we speak about cohesion, I'd really like to stress the cohesion of stakeholders themselves at the, at the national level and the local level. So how aligned the national strategies are with the local short-term. Short -term. And Professor Barca said that oftentimes that has to be put uh, uh, under close watch of what the uh, small municipalities uh, are doing with, with the research they've been given. But, again, really not replacing uh, the, the local elites because the, the idea that you can function uh, in a centralized fashion top-down is exactly uh, a futile strategy and, and perhaps uh, Sweden is a champion of this more horizontal approach of bottom-up. Um, so, uh, failing fast, setting uh, short-term short, short -term goals which are attainable uh, I think is, is one way of how to attract the kind of people we would love to see in, in the public institutions. So people that tend to think of, of startups or corporations as their possible uh, em, uh, employer, they would consider uh, public institutions and bring the energy and insight and, and risk often and risk taking attitude into local constituencies. Because oftentimes the, the people who are living or when working in institutions, uh, they don't want to be open for innovation and risk. And I think that the younger uh, and more agile uh, workforce is one of the instruments how to attain the goals that have been set by, by the commission. So uh, new forms of work, place-based strategy, renaissance of, of place, um, social challenges for those who are uh, on, 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 um, on a rise with uh, illiteracy and digital area, and the vitamin C for cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was an exciting trip, uh, futuristic uh, excursion. Um, anyone wants to get involved? I'll, uh, I can myself actually drive this forward, but I, you know, uh, please, if you could uh, introduce yourself. Can we bring a mic microphone over there, please? Uh, I'm not sure whether we can switch the light on, but uh, it's fine. Go Thank on. you. Uh, my name is uh, Magnus. I'm from the Minister of Finance of Estonia. Uh, I would like to start with a comment, and which will end in a question uh, to the panelists. Uh, when we talk about uh, divergences between uh, regions in internally, uh, for example, in the Baltics, uh, we, I think we mostly talk about uh, uh, the capital region and the rest of the countries, uh, country. Uh, and, and then we often talk about uh, divergent divergences uh, in terms of uh, economic divergences, uh, which is uh, in terms of in the context of cohesion policy, very normal, GDP, uh, usually measured in, in the GDP. Uh, but my first comment is that uh, we should not perhaps look, the picture is not always that uh, black and white. Uh, when we talk about the investments, for example, uh, which we make from cohesion policy in the capital region, uh, from many investments, uh, also rest of the region, rest of Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania benefit, uh, for example, investments into uh, healthcare infrastructure or uh, investments into universities, research, research and development, which are in the capital region, uh, but this is, these are also for the benefit of the rest of the country. Uh, so dif so in, when uh, discussing divergences, uh, this also perhaps needs to be kind of looked at or, or taken into account. Uh, and also, uh, uh, by, the last, by the last panelist, panelist it was mentioned that uh, uh, the way we work uh, changes. Uh, you can live far away in a village and work for an employer in the capital region. Uh, and this is uh, also not uh, always reflected uh, in, the, in the GDP. Uh, and secondly, uh, of course, uh, you can measure divergences between uh, urban areas, capital region, and the rest of the country, rural areas, uh, also in other terms. Uh, so my question uh, to the panelists would be, what other indicators are, uh, can we take into account to get a complete picture how large or small the divergences actually are between the capital region and the rest of the country or urban area and rural areas? Uh, 
Thank you. All right. Um, who wants to address this? Anyone, please? Um, Marco was very excited about yeah, the, the, uh, especially the Helsinki example as well. <laughs> it's very strongly goes to the new changing role of cities. And when we talk about the rural areas as well, so I've always stressed that it's actually it's a city-driven region. So we take the region and that inside the region we need that collaboration. But most of the new things, what you had the Helsinki Library, that happens in a bigger cities first. Actually, we did a, a good example already 25 years ago in the western part of the Helsinki metropolitan area in Espoo, the second largest city where I come from. Uh, so we uh, uh, had, after a big political debate, the decision to move our, one of our main regional libraries to the new shopping center. Some political groups were uh, strongly against because libraries are the places of citizens and you cannot integrate that to the market economy and so on. But that has changed, so it started to be really the role model of uh, participation. Citizens came there, uh, not exponentially growth, but very much. And, and the role of cities is totally new. And there we can accommodate us actually close to 20 years ago. We introduced, I was at that time the member of parliament in Finland. So we introduced there the library law, the new act, and added there that the role of libraries is to uh, support, assist in internet use as well. So having that on a broader role, and this is just a good example of the role of cities is more kind of catalyzing, enabling, and that's why I stress heavily this community-led development, because it's the local communities and people start feeling that they are part of that, and that, that we can integrate this kind of development in smaller cities as well, or even in villages, and now with the uh, di digital Europe, so we'll have more and more on this broadband integration, building uh, digitalized innovation hubs, which should not be only for the traditional business, but more really how to get citizen engagement and, and how the different, what are the needs of the citizens. So who is the one to produce the service? Not only anymore the city, it's these communities, senior citizens do much on their own, but through their communities. And that's something that we see very strongly growing especially what I know very well, so our uh, Finnish development. So there's much on this, and there we need the cohesion funds. As we have Committee of the St Regions, we have stressed that every region needs at least some cohesion funds, so that then they can build more of this collaboration based on their, these focus priority areas and learn from the others, whatever part of Europe they are. But we need to make at least the metropolitan areas and bigger areas, uh, cities, more attractive for young people as well, even if they go to study abroad, so they want to come back, have their own involvement there. They can do a lot through distance, thanks to the, the, the web and so on. So there's a lot of this new kind of mentality, and that's what we call as well see, this entrepreneurial mindset. It's not only establishing your own company, but start collaborating in very many new forms. Thank you, Mr. Burke, please. No, I think your, 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 the, the, your, your point on the limits of um, measuring uh, divergence in terms of per capita income is very important for a very simple reason. If you measure it that way, then you feel that your objective is to uh, uh, reduce that um, gap which uh, might simply be impossible. You never bring the gap between London and Calabria, the south of Italy, to, I mean, which is four times as much. You don't want to, to, to do that. But what you want to do, you make sure that the level of competence in mathematics of kids studying in Calabria is the same as the level of competence in mathematics of, of, of people studying in the center of London, which is different from the peripheries of London. Why? Because you want to give them a same chance, uh, and then they will really try to do whatever they want. So the issue of measuring is very important. If you start by measuring gaps in terms of uh, the following things, for example, you said, what, what else? Which is what I, I did very briefly. At the, uh, um, you know, how many, uh, I, I, I made the example of health, but there is something much more sophisticated, which is how many people in an area are improperly hospitalized? That's a very good indicator, very, can be measured. Be, to be improperly hospitalized means uh, your kids have an asthma, you run to the hospital, or you have diabetes. You should never in your life spend an hour in an hospital if you have diabetes or asthma for your kids. So that's a very good measure. So if you pinpoint that, 
and you aim at making sure that then suddenly realize that people in rural areas don't need yet another hospitals, old fashioned, hospitals everywhere, because hospital has to be very equipped with there's a minimum number of people. What you need to do is some doctors that can actually be close to the people so that they can be called, even more so for elderly, that get panicky uh, at a certain, if they uh, their kids with them. Uh, so by choosing the numbers, uh, you actually are already moving in the right direction. If you do choose, for example, the socialization for, for kids in schools, the problem in Italy at least is that in these little rural areas, kids, uh, uh, the, the competence is pretty, is pretty good because we know that multi-age multi, multi, multi sometimes is actually more effective. The problem is socialization. You have 14 kids that spend all their life for, for, for the, until 14. So at the end, of, when you're 14, you spend all your life with 12 kids in running around in the streets or in the school. Either you're gone gaga, or if you're bright, you want to run away. There is no alternative. So suddenly you dis but then, and so that allows me, and last, last point, to make another example typical to, of your library. If you arrive from, from, from the city, I say, your schools are too small. We are, they, they are inefficient because we, of course, for the same school you have uh, teachers, you spend too much because instead of having 27, you have 14. And then you tell to the people that have to close their old schools and concentrate them. They feel that you're doing for efficiency reasons. They're not given a chance to say what kind of schools they want, what shape of the school, what shape of the classes. Maybe they want a swim pool. Maybe they want a long area because suddenly realize that some of the some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, disciplines might be studied outside, which you cannot do in a town, by observing the stars, because on, you don't have the light disturbing. If you give the chance to the, if you pinpoint the socialization problem, you bring it to them, you discuss with them, and, but you need time. <laughs> you need time. They're very suspicious at the beginning. They, you think you're doing it just because you want to shut schools. You, you say, you might not spend it that way, and they will discuss it and discuss it again, and you have people on the ground, you get new human resources. You get a, you need, a, I'm not saying just because you're here, you need some psychologists, anthropologists, people, sociologists, people knowing how to deal with people uh, inside the administration, possibly sometimes, uh, not just lawyers and economists and statisticians. Then you can actually extract from the people the knowledge of what they really want. And you know what? They can even actually accept that it will not happen for three or four years because they know what is coming and they're part of it. So, but, but then, but everything starts, if you measure everything GDP and your point is increase GDP, then you transfer money to create new firms, then, you, then, you, then you're lost. All right, anyone else wants to get involved, please? Anyone? Yeah. Um, can I see you there? Yes, please, can we get the microphone over there? Introduce yourself, please. Uh, yeah, my name is Yuri Skaja. I'm a journalist, and I'm, I'm an improvised journalist because I learned about this thing uh, from the publication that wants me to do something about it only uh, like last night. Um, and my conception of what the cohesion funds are all about is like five minutes reading on the internet. But anyway, uh, one of the big problems here, one of the biggest exports of all of these three Baltic countries are people who go away. Uh, hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, one of the problems is, especially you were talking about rural uh, depopulation, uh, demographics and everything else, is that there are programs here, at least in Latvia, to try to bring these people back with, shall we say, limited degrees of success. But anyway, how does the whole cohesion funding and policy fit in with these efforts? Are you working together with some of these bring them back programs? Are some of the efforts to uh, create workplaces to improve infrastructure in certain areas part of that uh, capacity to have something for the people if they do come back from picking berries in Ireland or whatever they're doing? Thank you very much. Who wants to tackle this? Anyone? Please. Grab mic over there, yes. I could maybe start. <laughs> As I said also, um, yes, indeed, we are aware that uh, the demographic uh, uh, issue is, is a challenge in, in Europe as a whole, uh, mainly uh, not so much from migration, but from the aging and the structure of the aging of the population. But clearly, uh, especially in the three Baltic states, the, the migration, the outward migration 
is an issue on also the internal migration, uh, moving from the, uh, the regions uh, to the capitals, uh, mainly, uh, I will say, uh, still to the surroundings of Riga and to Tallinn, and I think in Estonia, in, uh, in Lithuania, is maybe uh, a bit more balanced, the internal uh, migration. So there are different aspects of the demographical changes that I think they have to also be tackled in different, in different manners. Uh. Um, and, I, and we believe, of course, that cohesion policy could, of course, play a very, very important role. First, helping or, or helping the national authorities and the local levels and the regional levels to identify uh, the reasons behind uh, why people are leaving, uh, but also trying to address on a very, and I think this is a bit the common uh, message today, on addressing tailor-made strategies. I don't think there is a recipe that, and one size fits all policy for, uh, for, for the three Baltic states. I don't think there is a one fit size all in for a policy uh, which will fit a national level, but I think that it should be going a bit more in deep in, in the regional analysis, in the regional disparities and try to see what are the, the different issues. What cohesion policy is trying to see, uh, to do is, as we were discussing this morning, is trying to put, uh, to try to embrace growth and jobs in, in, in the different uh, countries and in, different, in the different uh, regions. So I think we can also argue if um, what will be the right strategy, and we have also uh, different experiences in, in the European Union. Uh, some countries addressing that only on pure growth-based um, approaches, or maybe also having also some adapting, I would say, adjustment, also adaptability strategies in order to overcome this, 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 this uh, demographic challenge. So I think, yes, indeed, the cohesion policy has an answer to it, but this answer it has to be, again, tailor-made and uh, has to be, uh, first, um, the, the, the real challenges need to be identified at local and regional level, and then, of course, tailor-made strategies will have to be designed. Um, I'll address this issue uh, that was raised from two points. Uh, first of all, we have to put it in perspective. Uh, every city in Europe is losing its young population to London. You can do all you want, or Rome, or Paris, or Berlin. Mom and dad and the city municipality and the mayor, they can you know, lose their sleep as much as they want. You're 18, you want a big city. The one thing you can do is make sure that if you're part of a smaller town, that at least in your, in your state, there's one city you'd like to go to. Because oftentimes what we have in Latvia, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Lithuania and, and Estonia, same, people living in Narva or in Kaunas, they don't even stop in Vilnius or Tallinn. They go right away to, to London. And, and I think that's a loss for the 18 to 25-year cohort. That's important that they would have one city um, that they have, can stop. And the, the trouble is that oftentimes in, in, in policymakers, uh, and especially in the regions, there is this uh, chasm between pitting against and uh, blaming everything from the big city, that the big city and the capital city is eating up all the resources and therefore the regions are lagging behind. And I think that's not fruitful at all, because sometimes that is the case and sometimes it isn't. But if you're losing all of your young people to London, Paris, or, or Berlin, I mean, what, well, what else are you going to do? You, you're, not gonna, you, you're not gonna turn your small city into London, never. You have to have one city that, that is uh, uh, competitive on, on European level. Number two, is the ones that young, and, and this is, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who has spent uh, quite a few years ab abroad. W once you've lived uh, in this uh, five square meter room in Rome or Paris or Berlin with, you know, abominable conditions for seven years, I mean, you may want to have a partner, you may have a family. It's important that by the time you're 29, 31, 33, you know, we're getting kids later these days, it's important then that that small town that has lost you 12 years ago has that mayor who went out to the, to the school which is about to be closed and said, how about we think of a school on wheels? How about we think of that your kids go to the, to the swimming, uh, swimming pool or ballet in, in, a, in another town? Because imagine that city, you know, it's you know, 5, 10, 15, 20,000. If you have that mayor who did this tailed approach to a problem there, that, that mayor is probably known all around the, the, the state. Because that mayor is really looking up to what your needs are, then that person that left the, the, the city 12 years ago, he'll 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 think, well, how about me and my family, you know, high-income earners, we're going to go there, that city, and speak to that mayor, 
Has he got anything to offer? And I'm, I bet all of you here in this audience know cases like that have happened. I know a few cities in Latvia and in Lithuania that have these kind of a tailor-made mayors that really reach out to the communities and work this out. How we can make a school on wheels, how we can make a hospital on wheels and really try to address the issue. And once, in, just imagine how strong that and resilient the community is that they know they have a mayor that has their back. It may take 17 years, 15 years, or 10 years that people, those people come back and they set up a business and that business becomes an integrative part of tourism track because those people have learned and done their, you know, work, work their uh, shoes in a, in a uh, hotel business somewhere in Switzerland, in Sweden, or somewhere, and they know how to run business. And that mayor has gained, I don't know, 20, 30,000 euros just from having that family live there because they can set up a business that no one else can community. And that takes forever to set this up, but it's, it's, it's a system that Professor Barker just set up a fragment, an episode of, but that's the, the new, that's the new kind of a city point two oh, cohesion policy 2.0 that is about to happen. And those who will not catch up, sorry, I, I, I'm not making a living of cohesion policy so I can say what I want. Thank you. Please, Jochen, yes. If I may, yeah. Sure. Um, Sweden does not have a, a the similar situation with people leaving the country, but there is still still equal problems in the sense that people move from rural areas to Stockholm or Gothenburg, so the problem is more or less the same. And how do you deal with that? Well, I think a couple of reflections. First of all, it's of course hard to keep up the service levels all over Sweden, and the local authorities have a large uh, responsibility for uh, providing school and care and, and, and roads and so on. And if you are a small local authority with uh, like five, five or six thousand inhabitants, there is not tax uh, collected enough to, to, to provide for all the services that, is, uh, uh, that, that they have are responsible for. So there is a redi redistribution system uh, meaning that uh, r richer and bigger local uh, communes are paying to the smaller, poorer ones. And that's one way of keeping up this, the service levels, of course. Doesn't, you know, solve all the problems, but it does help out. Another uh, reflection is uh, the fact that the whole thing we're talking about here, regional growth policy, cohesion policy and so on, is doing what it can to promote local uh, entrepreneurs, uh, local uh, companies you know, to grow to, uh, because there is very often a situation where you have SMEs and they don't really want to expand. They keep a few employees and, and it's kind of a threshold to, to start to go abroad and export because there, you run into so many new problems and you don't have the kind of overhead dealing with these things. So there is a lot to do to promote the, the local business life. And, and uh, the government has to that, and that's my third reflection here, is try to um, also uh, redistribute part of the government agencies. I mean, they are, for natural reasons, to a large extent um, located to Stockholm. But over the last four years, there has been a redistribution where you try to move a whole agency or part of an agency to different smaller cities around, uh, around in Sweden. And that's one way of keeping the government very present uh, 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 all over the country. That doesn't solve all problems, but it does provide uh, 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 a certain incentive for people normally with higher education to move to smaller countries will itself have some dynamic effects. So there are things that you can do in order to try to counter some of these demographic effects some on the force of urbanization. But of course, this is, you can't really completely change the very force in, in an urbanization, but you can try to make it as smooth as possible and, and try to, to, to get all regions to have a decent service level and also to have to, to develop uh, on their own merits. And that's why, again, the 
bottom-up approach, as we have all, I think, expressed now, is so important, and, 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 and that you try to promote competence and, and the kind of feeling that we can develop this, even if the challenges are big. Professor. Um, yeah, let me point to uh, an issue that relates amazingly enough to the macro issue of relation between cohesion policy and national policy. Yes, you're right. In some cases, the constraint of, uh, of uh, the resources uh, uh, for local authorities is relevant. Yes, uh, in recent times, we have seen a recentralization of, of, of taxation, which is terrible because it's the answer, ah, that's why we have gone in the wrong way, so we need to recentralize. There is no knowledge in the centers to take decisions, but, but there are many other cases, particularly for essential services, which are the responsibility either of regions for countries with, with, with uh, federalist countries or with, of the nation. Education is an example, so let's come back to school. Sometimes the constraint is somewhere else, it's not in the resources, it's unfortunately in the sectoral silos in the way administration is, uh, is designed. I'll make an example, otherwise we are in the vague. Suppose we have done a very good job in Italy. Suppose that, there, I, mean, I mean, we have here and there, some, somewhere not. Uh, I suppose that what you describe has happened. People have met together and decided to close six tiny schools in six small villages. It's tough, huh? because it's tough for the citizens. You feel you're losing something, but they've done it because they, they believed that by doing a school with 250 kids, in one place and guaranteeing the passing, they will be better off. They have decided it after a year and a half. Everything is done. They have expressed in three pages after a year work of focus groups the, the, the needs they have. They become an input for architects rather than inventing from scratch. Everything seems to work. The money is there. The money is there. Then comes the Minister of Education. He says, hey, wait a minute. To how many kids? 250. But the rules that we have written for the whole country is 310. So, is a, is, is a, this is place unaware, place blind, sectorial policies that have set the same standard for Rome and for a tiny borough that suddenly say we can't do it because we have decided not to do it. So, it is the state that does not adapt in its policies. We have that all over the places. The problem is the public administration, we have shaped it sectorially in a, in a, in a completely disintegrated way. And so these messages, these strategic ideas, this place-based, this uh, regaining trust, can you imagine the reaction of people that we've been working for a couple of years when the school is not coming? We've, we'll be worse off, and now at the moment we are struggling with that in Italy, on that very issue. So I'm very frank and honest because everything is on the newspapers anyway. But this is just to say that this issue of uh, destroying the, the sectorial silos, that's why I'm slightly worried about, I love that goal number five, but still, I'm frank, place-basedness in the, in the design of cohesion policies now has got its goal number five. What about the other four? What about the other 80% of resources? I would like the place-basedness to be an horizontal preoccupation of the whole structure. This is still open and still hope that by what the work we'll be doing, uh, uh, we can move ahead, rather than considering place, place as, yes, another sector. This is sector N plus one. So we leave the, the people enjoy and convinced that territory, territory is very important, have their own little garden where to play. Sorry for the joke. Okay, uh, let me just add a few things because I need to uh, rush to the airport to be in Innsbruck for the, one of the meetings in the evening. The, um, I fully agree with Fabrizio what you said, so that there are some of these elements that need to go through the whole, whole uh, cohesion policy. And that's what we need to work on. Because when it's important for the local people, when they build their local communities of practice, so then they integrate more people and they make the place more attractive. And that's really what, what uh, is, is the core of this. And cohesion finance is only part of the financing. We need to have uh, use of the other financing instruments, private as well, so try to get more out of this and, and then share. And that's what we have, the Committee of the Region as well, for a couple of years we have stressed that actually closing one of those divides, innovation divides. So we have stressed that every region can be a forerunner and should be on their own situation, kind of tailor-made solutions there, and then sharing the experiences, and that's what will be more and more the future. And we need to increase the innovativeness in general, so we need to 
have whatever London and, and those who are the leading, we need to have them involved as well because we can learn from those as well, get, get everyone more on board and on a higher level. And there is something that that's why we need cohesion funds and we need to put that more now on the human capital. But exactly as you said, so one side does not fit to everywhere. We need to tailor make that. We have a good examples of kind of a, uh, service center development on local level where we integrate different activities, city paying part of that, so having their whatever part of the library or part of the healthcare, but then a lot of private activities and uh, reserving rooms and other facilities for citizens to use that as their own added uh, value living room as well. Thank you. Marco, uh, thank you much. I, I, I understand you need to leave, right? And it's not because you don't like the company, but because you need to be in, in certain other meetings. We don't want you to miss the airplane, so thank you very much for coming. I'll, um, so, uh, everyone, if, thanks, cheers. Um, if everyone can stay along, others can stay along for just uh, my concluding, um, and I think he might have wished he stayed because my last uh, question was, will be based on an imaginary situation. Let us imagine all of you go fishing uh, to the pond, right, and you catch the golden fish, and the golden fish, as it goes in the saying, right, leave me alone, release me, and I'll give you the three fishes or something. So, but this is a very weird golden fish, and it says, I'll make you the Tsar, the dictator of cohesion policy in the European Union, right? You get three wishes. You're, you're, you can do anything uh, uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, basically, whatever. Three wishes. A, B, C. Anything uh, that uh, you can you know, summarize in, in three wishes, you would implement. That, that is something that will make it work better. Uh, it will have a, a, a better outcomes. Um, well, who wants to start? Esther's. Shall we start in the sort of opposite order and finish with uh, Professor Barco over there uh, with the golden fish? What, what is your answer to the golden fish? Um, well, one issue is it's not just my idea, but we've been working in, 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 in planning and regional development a bit in Latvia, is that it is inevitable that uh, what you know, Mr. Croft just said, that the services won't be, won't be provided in the same geographical division as they've been before. So there are way too many small cities, way too many medium cities, and the services have to be, uh, are way too distributed, and they have to be concentrated more. So there has to be network-based development of cities and as far as social services go. That's number one. And it, this sounds way easier than it is for cities to cooperate to provide education or healthcare or, uh, or public services or sports. Or, or That's number, number one. Number two, I would allocate uh, funding uh, to early innovators in a similar fashion as you have in the startup community, you, you don't uh, punish the innovation, but you prize the innovation. And if we talk about innovation in Europe, the cohesion has to follow too. And what I see is a deficit among the cities to take any risks. There's a lot of stupidity, but there are not any many intelligent risks taken among the cities as far as the, as the, as far as the um, work uh, uh, and education and social services go. So I would allocate funds for projects then, that can fail, but if they don't, they disrupt the way things are done as far as the public administration goes. So that's, I have only two things, and if one of those would work out, that would be a fantastic advancement of the, of the cities and, and regions. Thank you. Well, um, I don't know, three wishes. <laughs> Well, I, you get four I, because the yeah, is just two of them. <laughs> no, I, I could maybe put it like this. I think the commission proposal is, is actually more or less uh, a golden fish or whatever. <laughs> we are, uh, from our point of view, uh, I would say fairly <laughs> content with the, with the proposal. And it contains a lot of the things that we would have wished, that we wished for, and not just uh, wishing in a pond, uh, trying to convince partners, including the Commission, that this was a reasonable approach. Uh, I'm not saying 100%, but to a large extent. And, and uh, pointing out uh, things that might, uh, being it a, a focus uh, on, on, on the, those regions most in need, uh, that you are also lowering the 
the co-financing levels. I know that I shouldn't say this here, but still from our point of view that's important. Uh, uh, simplification we think is very good, even if we are, have to discuss exactly how this is going to be done. Uh, we think the introduction of links to, to, the, um, to the rule of law and also to migration is a very good thing. Uh, so in that sense I think we are quite happy with the proposal, not meaning that there are thing, issues to, dis to debate. And I would just like to explain why I am s saying my final th statement here. We, we think that uh, not only the fact that you have proposed the lowering of the co-financing, but also that you have reduced the overall budget is something that we can support very much so. And let me just explain why, because there are different views here and there are good reasons for all views, let's say. But the view of the, Swed the Swedish government and the Swedish parliament is the fact that a German colleague pointed out earlier, this, to, earlier today. And the fact is that as a net contributor uh, and, and combination with uh, a Brexit, a possible Brexit, means that the, our contribution might end up increasing like 30-40%, which just is not possible for any government to, to bear. So this is in the other, in another consideration that has to be taken, and that is why we are uh, supporting the reduction of the cohesion policy. But cohesion policy is important, it will continue, we will be net contributors, we are happy to, to, to support anything that can improve the cohesion policy, and we definitely realize the importance of of the cohesion policy and the regional growth policy overall in order to tackle all the problems that has been pointed out today and that we are all aware of. Thank you. Cheers. Well, after uh, this, I think, well, my first wish, I think, is not a surprise. <laughs> uh, we, we consider as Commission that the proposal of the Commission, especially for the cohesion policy, is well balanced. Uh, we know that many, I mean, some member states, and I hear already this morning that maybe are not fully 100% happy, although I understand that they are happy, but maybe they are also ha uh, hiding a bit their happiness. So I hope that uh, at the end this happiness will sort of uh, come into the center of the discussion. Uh, so my first wish will be a, a timely agreement at the European level on MFF and also on the future of the cohesion policy. Because as I said, I think that after listening to the Commission before uh, also proposing and putting on the table the proposal, has tried to listen uh, to all, uh, all member states with the different challenges, the different points of view, and we consider that this is a reasonable, I would say, balanced um, proposal. Also because they are also, uh, I mean, playing with the restrictions we, we have, with the new challenges, with the Brexit, but also tr balancing the way we want to go for it. For example, uh, we have heard today um, a lot about the uh, lowering the co-financing rates. Uh? And also one of the reasons of lowering these co-financing rates, which of course we understand that is putting much more uh, weight and burden into the national uh, financing ministries, uh, is that we want to maintain the same level of investment. So we are aware that we may have a more uh, limited budget, but we will still like to achieve the same level of investments to try to achieve uh, the, the results. So first wish uh, timely agreement at policy level among uh, all the actors at European level. Second, I will say something that I already more or less hinted in, my, in, in the last part of my intervention, timely start of uh, the programming and implementation. I think again, hopefully, uh, once we will have a better picture of the rules of the game, uh, I think what is very, very important is the timely preparation of the programming and implementation. I think it's not a secret that this programming period has been a very, very, very slow take up. Uh, and uh, I think that um, it's not only about figures and financial execution and being able to, provide, to, pro to, pro to justify the cohesion policy, but it's also about trying to boost up the economic development and try to create growth and jobs as, as soon as possible. And we believe that by w starting to work together on the, on the programming, on the, on, the, on the policy priority setting uh, uh, is, is, is of utmost importance to ensure then 
of course, uh, good results. And then the third one, the third wish, will be these multi-level governments. I think that, again, that this collaborative approach where uh, I think everybody has to feel ownership of the cohesion policy. Cohesion policy is not about Brussels. Cohesion policy is not about the national governments. I think for cohesion policy is uh, uh, about the citizens in Europe, and I think this message has to, be, has to pass. I think it has to pass also now, as I said, and I think the, my wish is that every single actor, every single citizen in Latvia, I say, because I'm in Latvia, they have the impression that they can be actors of their, of their future, that they can shape the future. And we believe that the cohesion policy is giving this opportunity to every citizen to shape their, their future. So I think this will be wish is that this ownership is of the cohesion policy and the working methods of the cohesion policy is embraced at all different levels. We talk too much about national and regional, but also local, but also citizen level. So they believe that they, they, they can participate and they can shape their also future. Thank you very much, ma'am. I want to make the most of this uh, golden, golden fish. Uh, <laughs> just three things. One I, one I said, uh, but I know will not happen. So that's why I uh, link it to your uh, hope when the, that uh, the prime minister look at each other in their eyes the next meeting and before coming to an agreement, they understand that uh, whatever they will decide will be ineffective unless they allow the European Commission to recruit 500 new young people in uh, experts in doing this activity. We need that. Without that, everything we've been talking about goes nowhere because this policy we're talking about is complex. It requires people on the ground. I would like to see in my Sicily, which is doing very badly in Italy, spending very badly the money, I'd like to see far, I'd say one Latvian, one Belgian, one British, and maybe one guy from northern Italy being recruited and being sent, not spending one day a month or a year in Sicily. I would like to spend their, his life. Five young, bright guys can change it. Not because they will advise the regional government change the world, but because they will destabilize the order of things. Development is about destabilization of the order of things. This is the true role of the European Commission. It's fair and impartial spectator. This time. You, you do a fantastic job. I, I, could, I, I, I didn't know you. I, I, heard it. No, I heard it from the analysis. You all do it. Most of you do it. You, you who preside over countries, but you cannot follow every project and you, and you cannot be there deciding whether the participatory approach is just a blah blah uh, written on a report or it's true. You, 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 you can't do it and uh, you need people on the ground. So my first wish is 500 people recruited. It's the cost of two big motorways spent by structure of five. People say, oh, technical assistance, you, you're not, you can't do it. This is, this is increasing number of people, it's a human resource. It's the cost of two useless motorways somewhere in Europe. The second wish uh, is that uh, is linked to the first. Since you have these 500 people, you can entrust them to truly monitor that partnership is real and that outcomes are truly measured. Very simple, the second. And the third is that in the next electoral, next election, European election, uh, majority of parties, whoever they are, suddenly put in their agenda one thing that my, what would have been uh, until a couple of years ago, my Swedish colleague has, uh, is extracting from me, which is the European budget, cohesion policy, Agricultural policy horizon cannot be financed by transfer from states. They have to be financed as every federal government in the world or pseudo federal by taxation. So until they will be financed by transfer of, of member states, you will have a contradiction of a country saying it is very important, it is fundamental, but sorry, I need to reduce the amount of money because it's coming from me. Italy is, doing, is, is possibly doing the same. We, we, I negotiated as a minister the previous budget and we were there. So the, the feeling that Europe needed more money, but feeling that at the end of the game, Italy was going to give this more money because we are net contributor, we are not. This is nonsense. This is, we're building a Europe with money which is transferred from rich, rich states to, 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 to poor states. It doesn't work like that. 
the, it, it, a federal government does not survive, or a pseudo federal government does not survive if there are rich regions transferring funds. The funds has to come through taxation, obviously not increasing the taxation, but uh, replacing existing taxation. There is a proposal, so my dream is the Mario Monti's proposal for, uh, for uh, having a different revenue system uh, is suddenly enlightened, and all the politicians in Europe say, yeah, if we win the European Parliament, that's our goal, otherwise we're going nowhere. I'm afraid for that wish to come true, you would have to catch a golden whale or something, not a golden fish. Well, thank you very much for this. Um, let me switch back to Latvia in a bit to, to sum this up. Godete draug, mes patiešām esam izrunājuši ļoti daudz tematus šodien. Man patiešām nāk secināt noslēgumā, ka nevienam no jums, kas strādā šajā jomā, viegli nebūs. Nākamais daudzgadu budžets dzims diezgan lielās mokās, varbūt tādās, kā nav redzēt Brexits un drošības izaicinājumu, kas tik vēl ne, kas naudiņu kohēzijai draudz samazināt un, un ir arī diezgan liels priedz. Dalība valsts starpā, kas noteikti pie saruna galda atspieguļies, uz par to, kā to naudiņu dalīt. Um, es secinu arī to, ka nu, vismaz daļai runātāji bija tādi uzskata, ka komisijas esošie piedāvājumi būtu diezgan nopietni koriģējumi šeit runa gar par budžeta prioritātēm, gan finansēšanas noteikumiem pašā kohēzijas politikā, bet mēs tajā pašā laikā redzējām, ka, protams, ka ir atšķirība, vai jūs esat valsts, kur vairāk iemaksā, vai tā valsts, kur vairāk saņem, kas pilnīgi neizbēgam. No Baltijas skatu punkti, es gribētu atgādināt to, ko mēs dzirdējām dienas pirmajā pusē, būtu pavisam atšķgārni ar finansējumu samazināt tikt sodīts no tie reģioni, kur no vienas puses pēdējā laikā ir piedzīvojuši diezgan strauji izaugsmi, bet tajā pašā laikā vēl atpaliek no Eiropas vidējā labklājības līmeņa. Ko mēs vēl šodien dzirdējām? Laikam jādzīmē tas, ka visi uzsvēr, ka kohēzija nav nekādu brīnumu nūjiņu, ka tas ir palīgu līdzeklis citiem pasākumiem, strukturālām reformām un tam līdzīgi, līdz ar to cim redzot jautājums, kā finansējumu labāk saistīt ar reformām. Um, bija arī diezgan izteikti pausts atbalsts lielākai elastībai kohēzijas politikas regulējumā, lai dalību valstīm pašām ir lielāka manevra iespēja fonda līdzekļa investīcijām, lai tās var investīt, investēt tur, kur lielākā atdeve. Bija ļoti interesants man šeit diskusijas par teritorijās attīstības pilsētu vidas jautājumiem, un tur tika secināts, ka nu, tie efektīvākie ir izsinājumi, protams, dzimst pašvaldību līmenī, bet tajā pašā laikā, un es šeit atkal citēšu profesoru Barku par to, ka attīstība dažkārt ir destabilizācija, un no vietējiem pašvaldībām tas prasa bieži vien izkāpšana no komforta zonas un tāda atvērtāka dialoga gan ar kaimiņu pašvaldībām, gan, gan saviem uzņēmējiem un iedzīvotājiem. Bet beig beigās sumējot to visu, es domāju, ka nu, par to nu, gan nebija strīdu šeit nekādu, ka, mm, ka kohēzijas politika ir patiešām nozīmīgs elements Eiropas Savienības uh, politikās mazāk attīstoto reģionu izaugsmē. Tāds eksistenciāls svarīgs uh, padiesībā ir un būs un saglabāsies elements Eiropas politikā, un tai vajadzētu saglabātais kā vienā no galvenajām Eiropas Savienības budžeta prioritātēm. Mēs varam sapņot varbūt par laikmetu, kad tas tiks finansēts nevis no dalību valsts kontribūcijām, bet no kāda Eiropas Savienības nodokļa, uh, bet tā būtu laikam nākamā jau pietur uh, kaut kad tālāk. Mēs redzējām ļoti interesants man šķiet realizēto projektu piemērs infrastruktūras, pētniecības un mazo uzņēmumu grupā, kas patiešām arī dod to praktisku atskaits punktu, ka tas nāk par labu tai skaitā ne tikai kohēzijas jautājumos, bet tas nāk par labu arī Eiropas Savienības kopējai konkrēta spēja. Nu lūk, jūsu rindas ir kļuvušas nedaudz retāks, kas arī ir pilnīgi loģiski šāda veida konferencē, kur iestiepas pēcpusdienā, bet Lai arī kādas nebūtu, es esmu palēcināts, ka tā mūsu pulcēšanās šeit šodien ļoti raibā lokā, kā mēs to redzējām, ir, ir mazs varbūt, bet vērtīgs ieguldījums tajā diskusijā, ko mēs redzēsim nākamajā periodā, gan par daudzgadu budžetu, gan par ieguldījumu kohēzijas politikā. Ar to es varētu finišēt, un es gribētu, lai jūs man pievienotos aplaudējot mūsu pēdējiem panēlim, kur bija lielis. Paldies! Mūsu sesija līdz ar to šodien noslēdzas. Jums vēl ir iespēja visiem uzkavēties. Tur ir tāds ļoti īpatnais fotostūrīts. Tur vēl var aiziet un uztaisīt ļoti foršas bildes. Uh, and for those of you visiting with us, I uh, will just like to um, uh, put forward the idea that you could uh, visit the railway museum that's right over there. Just use the opportunity. Uh, that's quite impressive as well. And that's it. I'll see you around. Tiksimies kādā citā reizē. Paldies jums visiem.